So, ladies and gentlemen, meine Damen und Herren, Signore e Signori, my name, uh, my name is uh, Chiara Caradonna, I am a literary scholar and a translator, and I have the great honor and pleasure to moderate this uh, panel uh, with these wonderful writers here today on literature and diaspora. Um, the program uh, will uh, look like follows. Uh, we will have a conversation uh, among us. I will uh, tell you the names of our uh, illustrious guests in a moment, and then we will proceed to a musical evening and uh, a poetry reading. Um, I will start by presenting the authors uh, on stage uh, and our wonderful translator from uh, Simultaneous Translator. Um, not simultaneous. Hmm? Not simultaneous. Not simultaneous. <laughs> More or less. <laughs> so uh, next to me is sitting Miriam Busermi. Uh, she was uh, born in uh, Tunis, studied law uh, and political science at the University of Tunis, Carthage. She's currently... Carthage? She's uh, currently working on a PhD at the University of Hildesheim on the topic of staging injustice. She has been a writer, a theater director, a lawyer, a lecturer, a researcher, and a polyglot bridge builder. So uh, a, very, a very good uh, uh, beginning for our conversation, I'm sure. From two, uh, between 2002 and 2007, she was author and, uh, and director at the Arab African Center for Theater Training and Research um, at the Hamara Theater in Tunis. Uh, and she came to Berlin in 2018. Uh, and since then, she has been developing an, um, a multilingual uh, style of writing um, and an approach that is uh, transcultural. I think you speak about a, a, a jungle of languages, right? A, a, a multitude of languages that uh, converge together. One of her uh, theater pieces is uh, uh, called The Titel ist frei übersetzbar. The title is free, it can be freely translated, um, but uh, another title, just to give you a, a sense or an impression of her work, um, uh, is titled What the Dictator Didn't Say, and was a very important uh, stage piece uh, in Tunisia. Um, so uh, recently she also has uh, written um, a text, another text called Memoir en Retraite, uh, so uh, Memory in Retreat, uh, that has been also uh, translated. Uh, I'm going maybe uh, according to the line. Antonio Ungar was born in Bogota in 1974. Uh, his novels are translated into seven languages and his short stories have been included in more than 20 anthologies uh, in five languages. Um, his novel Tres Atuades Blancos was awarded in 2010 with the prestigious Herralde Prize and was shortlisted, shortlisted for the Romulo Gallegos Prize in 2011. Other prizes and distinctions include representing Colombia in the IWP residence in 2005, representing Colombia in the Granta Magazine Latin American Anthology in 2007, um, and getting the National Journalism Prize, Simon Bolivar. Uh, his last two novels, Mirame, 2019, and Eva y las Fieras, 2022, are currently being translated into French. Uh, then we have Moshe Sakal, uh, a novelist uh, acclaimed by NBC, Le Monde, Haaretz, uh, who has published six novels in uh, Hebrew. His novel, The Diamond Setter, uh, other press in New York, Cit uh, New York uh, uh, City 2018, has been translated into English by Jessica Cohen and was a winner of the Man Booker Prize. His novel, Yolanda, was published in 2012 um, and has been translated also to uh, French. Uh, the forthcoming novel, Moses the Neanderthal, has, is being translated by Anne Birkenhauer into German. Uh, Sakal uh, has published also in the literary magazine Sin uh, und Form, and in the, recently in the German newspaper Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung. Uh, his themes cover uh, are exile, immigration, diaspora, border crossing, queer life. So uh, again, a very good choice <laughs> for our panel. Um, and in 2021, he was awarded the literature grant of the Berlin Senate Department for Culture and Europe in support of his forthcoming novel. Uh, Fariba Wafi uh, was born in Tabriz in 1963 and currently lives in Berlin. She started writing as a teenager and her short stories were published in literary magazines. Her first collection of short stories was published in 1986. Her first novel, My Bird, became an instant bestseller in uh, 2002 
uh, as did all her following books. Since then, she uh, uh, has written seven novels and five short story collections uh, for which she has received the country's uh, so Iran's most prestigious literary uh, awards. In 2017, she was awarded the uh, Liberatur Prize at the Frankfurt uh, Buch uh, Buchmesse. Her works have been translated into numerous languages, inclu including German, uh, of course, French, English, Georgian, Turkish, and Kurdish. And in 2021-22, she was a fellow at the DAA, the Artist in Residence program in Berlin. Next to her is sitting, is sitting Nushin Mameyan Prenslov, who will be the translator uh, this evening. Um, so I think you got an impression already of the multitude of languages uh, and of uh, places of origin that we have re uh, uh, gathered here today uh, on the stage. Um, let me present finally uh, our um, speak our poet. Uh, where is Dori? <laughs> Um, uh, who will uh, uh, follow our conversation, Dori Manor, uh, a poet, writer, translator, and editor, was born in Tel Aviv. Uh, he was a founder, uh, founding group in 19, uh, find, founding member in 1993 uh, of the literary group Ev, uh, whose aim was to find a new poetic interface between classical and modern Hebrew. Uh, he moved to Paris and uh, was there for 10 years where he studied French literature um, and uh, also uh, um, he earned his PhD uh, at Inalco. Um, Manor is also the founder and editor of the literary magazine O um, and the 21st, a collection of translated literature. He served as editor-in-chief at Israel's Educational Program for the Arts and Humanities and he was a lecturer uh, at Tel Aviv University and other uh, institutions as well. Uh, in Israel, uh, he's uh, uh, very, very well known and uh, uh, authoritative, I would even say, uh, in, uh, um, in issues of translation. He has translated Translated uh, the classics of French literature, Voltaire, Des Descartes, Molière, Flaubert, and the list is very long and goes on. Uh, but of course, he has al also published uh, five books uh, of poetry and a memoir, and um, this is what we will hear later on. And finally, um, we have our wonderful singers uh, and musicians, uh, Eva Glasmacher and Denisa. Popova. So uh, we have a very intense program ahead of us and always too little time, as is uh, unfortunately always the case uh, in these situations. So I would like um, to start from a bit of a geographical location and geographical and an understanding of space, of location and dislocation, where we are and uh, uh, where you come from and, and what brought you here. Um, most of uh, you come from what is today mostly referred to as the Global South, um, and you have been replaced, displaced um, to the Global North, and I was wondering what is the relation uh, for you be between these two spaces, between your, the space that uh, you come from uh, and uh, the space where we are here today uh, in Berlin, uh, in one of the capitals of Europe. So maybe we start just uh, with Miriam and uh, we move on. Oh. Guten Abend, so um, it's very difficult to make the start, of course. <laughs> it's a big responsibility to open the discussion or the debate or the reflection about the topic. Actually, it's a very, um, it's a very um, vague and uh, big question and I don't know, uh, or I have maybe a little bit um, uh, a problem with the terms or with the, with the um, the description of this movement, this geography, or this uh, uh, travel. Um, uh, what, is the, what is the relationship between uh, where, I, where I was born and where I live here? Uh, I will say it's a kind of, not a displacement, it's a, a kind of errantry, une errance, a kind of being on the move, a kind of being um, out of place, uh, as well in Tunisia as uh, here in Berlin or everywhere in the world. I don't live my. Um, I am not here because I am uh, um, for for political reasons or because there is a war in uh, uh, at home or because I am exiled or there is nothing from that. So uh, it's another situation. That's why I. 
I would uh, rather prefer to make the difference between uh, displacement or exile for people who cannot uh, come back to their homeland. I can go to my homeland when I want, and uh, it's not as well. Um, uh, for the moment, I live in Berlin, but I don't know uh, where I will be living in 10 years or in five years or in two years. So I, 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 I look at the question of um, living in another space or uh, changing countries or moving from Africa uh, to Europe as um, a right as first, as a right that I claim because I think we live in a, in a world where uh, the right is only the property of a half or even not the half, uh, the half of the half of the uh, uh, human beings. And it's not, for every, it's not easy for everyone to get the right to einfach, also, so einfach to say, I want to try something else. I want to be on the move. I want to, to, uh, to go somewhere else and make a new start or canal. Okay, so yeah, I have to be uh, very yeah. That's very very difficult <laughs> to stop. Yeah, okay. So I, no, I will I say think, this is. I think you you raised yeah. a very important point uh, of choice of the possibility of, of choosing to move and the liberty to move uh, in space. And right? to, and not to understand uh, diaspora or uh, not to understand uh, in my case uh, at least n not as a as a loss or as a, um, a difficult experience, of course it is, but as, a, as a, um, a possibility of being on the road, as a possibility of, be, of being in a, a sort of dérance, c'est-à-dire um, uh, being an errant being in the world. And this also goes along with the errancy of languages. You already heard uh, many, many languages slip through uh, the cracks, Absolute. right? Um, Antonio, how is it for uh, you? Well, I have been living more than 25 years out of my country, of Colombia. Um, I, go, I, I went back for a, a couple of times. Uh, so for me now, it's, it's also a situation of, of Herons, like moving on the move, uh, but I'm tired of being on the move, so I think I will stay in Berlin. Uh, it's tiring, even with the help of technology and con the, all the help of the contemporary world, but it's, it's tiring. Uh, and I think exile, in my case, is the same. I, I'm not forced to be out of, of Colombia. Uh, so, yeah, for me, um, I feel very free to move here or there or to... Or to to be in between. Also because of my family history, I'm fa half of my family is Austrian. So I was always feeling not totally Colombian, although I feel very Colombian, but I wasn't seen as a Colombian totally. Uh, and when I'm abroad, I'm Colombian. So my situation was always uncomfortable. And for me, that's, that's comfortable <laughs> to be this strange being that doesn't fit well anywhere. I lived uh, 10 years in Israel, and I was also not, I, I have Jewish ancestors, and I have Christian ancestors, so I was also not fitting totally. And I think all this situation of uh, not fitting, which for me is a positive characteristic, uh, it's, it shows in my writing. It's, uh, I like being not comfortable. I like being not stable. So although I have now three kids, so I should be more stable but <laughs> I can't. So yeah, this is another interesting question what what keeps one in one in a place right when does the errand stop and and why and we will certainly come to speak on how um, these errands influence each of your writings and how this resonates uh, in in the topics also that you choose uh, Moshe I'll say a few words about my roots and then I'll save the other thoughts for the next <coughs> questions about diaspora um, I I was born with a very simple story that became, which became um, more and more complex as I was uh, growing up. I was born in Tel Aviv for, um, in, into a family, um, okay, my, fam my parents were born in Tel Aviv. And I was Israeli, uh, son of natives. Uh, but uh, as I grew up, I realized that there's a story that uh, is not told. And unlike my Ashkenazi friends, uh, whose stories weren't told because of the Shoah and horrible uh, uh, things that happened to their families, my family, my grandparents always said uh, wonderful things about their lives in Egypt 
on one side, and in Syria, Damascus, on the other side. Uh, and only when I was 30, I started writing about this family. And um, these roots sent me away uh, uh, as, as I was discovering them. And that, uh, maybe we'll have a time to talk about it later, uh, that was a um, presumably mistake of nature, the nature of my immigrant um, grandparents who came to Israel in order to stay and in order uh, uh, that their uh, grandparents, uh, grandchildren um, will uh, be born in Israel and stay there and help their own country. So something went wrong. <laughs> and Berlin, how does Berlin fit in this constellation? Well, you have to lay your bones somewhere. And uh, I think that many people like Berlin because it allows you to, it's very cosmopolitan. Uh, uh, at the same time, uh, it allows you to keep your identity. My 20s I spent in Paris, France. Uh, it was wonderful, but I had something, something's got to give in France. You have to let go your identity. I could not be Jewish. I could not be Israeli. I could not be gay. I could be... A, 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 uh, Francais, Républicain, even if I don't have the, the nationality. And right when I, it started to happen and I was really assimilated, I left. <laughs> Not by chance, I imagine. No. <laughs> <laughs> Fariba. Okay, I'm Farsi. I'm in the fact that I can go to different places in this problem, but I can say that من دو سال و نیمه که از ایران آمدم و بیشتر عمرم رو در ایران بودم در ایران کارم رو در ایران نوشتم در ایران چاپ شده بنابراین خیلی چیزا رو با خودم آوردم اینجا در حقیقت توی ذهنم خیلی از داستانم و بنابراین اینجا گرفتار اون اون حالت های نوستالوژیک نشدم تا حالا شاید به خاطر اینکه به خاطر شبکه های اجتماعی چون میتونم هر لحظه خودم رو با جامعه ایران به روز بکنم و شاید هم بودن در برلین کمک میکنه چون شما وقتی که در برلین راه میری صدای لحجه های مختلف زبان های مختلف رو میشنوی و احساس to tell the truth, um, there are many dimensions of my coming here. Um, but, okay, I'm living here since two and a half years. And the most time of my life I spent in Iran. But I wrote there and uh, all of my books, most of my books were published there. And I brought a lot with me, and of course in my mind. And I don't feel nostalgic because, uh, till now at least, because uh, thanks to social media, I can connect easily to the society in Iran. And uh, of course it's also easy to stay in Berlin. You hear every day in the streets other languages, and um, yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, we will get actually to re return to this question because it's a question that I'm very interested in, but I think you have now an impression of the geography and this geography got more and more complicated at, uh, at each sentence, I, I had the feeling. Um, and so nation, nation states were dissolving in front of our eyes um, and, and you know, re reforming in different shapes and new shapes here in Berlin. Um, so let's uh, pause for a minute and look at the title of, of this event, Literature and Diaspora. Um, I would uh, like to hear from each of you what uh, you associate with the word diaspora, what it means to you. If you consider yourself at all a diasporic uh, author, um, if it ha affects your writing and your relation to the language, to the language you write in, if you, un I think you understood that we have here Arabic, French, German, also uh, Spanish, uh, Hebrew, and Farsi. So we really have a, a very broad spectrum of languages, um, and I'm sure that they also 
are influenced and, and you know, are, are impacted by the encounter with the language that you're immersed in. Um, you know, we know of many writers that when they uh, write outside of their, uh, you know, of the environment of the living language, they do lose the contact uh, with the language and they, uh, they miss it in a way. Um, so we'll repeat <laughs> the round uh, with Miriam. In the same, uh, okay. Yes, <laughs> yes for, uh, you know. For a geography, this is a, a new way of uh, doing maps. Okay, let's, let's do that. So um, uh, it's too many questions in one question, so I will try to, do, to, to make more questions. Maybe it makes more sense. Um, I am Tunisian, that means I, my first language is translation. In my uh, uh, country, uh, because we are a post-colonial country, I grew up with a, a Tunisian, which I consider as a language where we are constantly making a translation, translation from French in Arabic, from uh, Arabic, uh, a kind of Arabic because it's not Arabic. That means that I, my first uh, big play that won the prize for Arabic uh, theater, it was criticized actually by uh, Gulf uh, uh, colleagues that uh, this is not Arabic, this is uh, uh, an European language. Tunis Tunisian language is an European language. So, just to, to, to uh, make the nuance about what it means to speak or to live between languages or to change languages. So I grew up with Tunisian, with uh, uh, Arabic at school, Hoch uh, Arabisch, so classic Arabic, and then French, and then English, and then uh, Deutsch war meine fünfte Sprache, was my fifth uh, language that I started at college, that means uh, Hochschule for one uh, Stunde, eine Stunde pro Woche. So, und dann, uh, uh, I, I was invited to Germany to, 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 uh, to show my work as a Fariba as well after the DAD program, the, the very uh, famous program of one year with you think Berlin is the place to be, is the place out of the place, as we hear now. It's the place of this big illusion of everything is free, everything is possible, everything is uh, great. And of course, I stayed after this DRD uh, uh, um, uh, <laughs> program, of course, and then I get confronted with the reality of uh, the disillusion of uh, the Berlin and the disillusion of the visitor and then the, the immigrant situation, because I'm not an European citizen. I I, st I, st uh, I still, after five years, have to apply for visa every two years and to show that I have enough money. And as a writer and uh, um, uh, uh, a play director and a lawyer who cannot um, uh, practice here, cannot get a lot of uh, uh, money, so I have also no, ch no chance may maybe in one year to stay in Germany. So it's not as well like very easy as it seems to be easy. But yeah, so my relation to language is that means that of course, I am um, now uh, uh, working in German. That means I had a premiere at Volksbühne for two weeks. So I had a premiere and I, I wrote in uh, French and then we translated in German. I have a translator. I work with an uh, actress in German. Um, and I like it. And einfach für mich, das ist ein Spiel. It's, it's, it's um, a play. It's a game. I, I see this work between languages this in-betweenness, this out of space, this uh, switching languages is a kind of opening the, the, the possibility of uh, being in the mm. world in another way. Mm -hmm. This is my relationship to the language. Maybe later I come back to diaspora, which is something else for me. We, we will move around yeah. as we are in, in a diasporic conversation. You know, the, the word diaspora comes from spore, from seeds that are sown around. So we can throw many seeds out and we'll see which one, which one uh, give fruit or from which one comes a plant. Antonio, how do you see uh, literature and diaspora? And how do you see your Spanish, your also specific Colombian Spanish? Uh, in in this context, yeah, I'm a very lazy person. So <laughs> I live in Spanish. I read in Spanish. I write in Spanish. I work in Spanish for Colombia, not because I want to, but because that's the unfortunate, unfortunately the logic of economy. So it's the easiest way, place for me to find work because I'm not a professional in anything. Um, so my life is in Spanish. My kids speak six languages. 
so I feel very humiliated by them. <laughs> and uh, yeah, for me, my home is my language. So I really c can communicate with, the, with Latin America and with Spain through language. And uh, for me, it's enough. For me, yeah. Did it have implications for you, the fact of not being in Colombia constantly for such a long time? It has, yeah. When I go back, I'm a foreigner, and I'm, of course, a foreigner here. So uh, you become, what I was saying in the, f uh, as the, in the first uh, answer, you become a foreigner for life. You become dislocated always. But your language doesn't become foreign to you, in a way. No, not at all, no. No, I, I, yeah, I live in Colombian, in my, in my head, and I write in Colombian. And you don't miss or feel the need of hearing it daily, for example. I miss it, yeah. I, I taught my kids uh, very, very well uh, Colombian Spanish, and they go here to Latin American schools. Um, that's the way a lazy pa father should dedicate his kids, uh, to send them to the Latin American school. Um, but as I said before, they surpassed me very, very successfully. Uh, but I miss, yeah, I miss a lot being there. And when I'm there, of course, it's a feeling of ease, of you know, not having to be a foreigner all the time. Do you consider yourself a diasporic writer? I think the concept, it sounds pretentious, but I think it should be re-evaluated, re like, mm -hmm. not only, especially because of technology. Like, I feel in Colombia, I really do. Like, I talk to my sisters all the time, to my colleagues, to, writer, you know, friends, uh, I watch Colombian TV, I read Colombian writers, it's very easy. I, I'm sure it was much harder before, but for me it's very easy to be in Colombia in an artificial way, which is enough for me. Yes, we had that in the last years uh, a lot. Uh, all of us, this experience yeah, uh, exactly. got, uh, uh, got more acute. And this is, uh, yes, this is one of the questions that I had for you, because I, I agree that it changed dramatically the possibility of writing to a community yeah. by being far. Fariba also said the same, by be still yeah. being far, but being close in a way. So yeah, I write, I make my living as a podcast writer, so I write from Germany to Colombian podcast producers for podcasts that are, are heard all around the world. So it's, you know, it's very easy to communicate nowadays, and mm. I enjoy that mm. very much, yeah. Moshe, how do you understand your relation I have to say to that Hebrew. twice when Antonio was speaking, I really identified with your suffering and being torn between uh, the Heimat, the homeland, and, and, and being in diaspora. Um, the word in Hebrew for um, a homeland is moledet, and it is a special word because it, it is derived from the radical yalad, which is to be born. So this is the, pl the place where you were born, and of course you can be born in one place. Um, there's a wonderful verse of uh, Lea Goldberg, the great uh, Hebrew uh, writer born in Lithuania, who immigra immigrated to Tel Aviv, and she says, uh, say it first in Hebrew and then in translation, Ulay rak tziporei masa yodot, kshe'en tluyot ben eretz leshamayim, et ze hakev shel shtei hamoladot. Maybe um, only uh, migrant burns know when they are hanged between uh, the, the, the earth and the sky, this pain of two homelands. So this is a paradox, of course, having two homelands, especially as I just explained in Hebrew. And I always felt that I had an, a, a third uh, homeland, maybe also because I'm Moshe, Moses. I always identified uh, uh, myself with his story, some aspects of his story, <laughs> uh, especially. Uh, um, but it's the, the other way around. <laughs> I mean, yes, but uh, he, he saw the promised land and he never got there. And this is my third homeland. And every time I think I reach it, it goes far uh, and it slips. And uh, am I feeling myself a diasporic writer? I, paradoxal wise, I think that in, in Israel I felt more a, a diasporic uh, a writer than here. I wrote about other places while living in Israel. Uh, and when I'm here, I'm writing about Israel in Hebrew. And then I go to the, uh, the, I, I go to the window and I hear many languages from my, my building in, in the Hof at the yard in Kreuzberg. 
maybe there's one roommate vege uh, with German people. All the other people are, are coming from the whole world. This is wonderful, but at the same time, it, it confuses me because I know that we all share. We don't share. I mean, we have very different lives. I mean, there's no one Berlin. There are many, many, many Berlins. Mm. And I'll just say the last example. Uh, in the first lockdown, I, I, um, I hosted um, poetry events on Zoom uh, of the uh, literary magazine Ho that uh, uh, Dory uh, and I established uh, uh, in Paris uh, 20 years ago. And uh, thousands of people were watching these uh, programs in Israel and around the world. It was in Hebrew. And then I went, went out to the Landwehr Canal, <laughs> and I didn't know where I was. I mean, I knew, but I was. It was at the same time, it, it's a pleasure, and also it could be really confusing and, and bring suffer. Yes, I think that we had again, uh, you touched again on this topic of living in two worlds at the same time because of the technological uh, possibilities that we have now, right? We are yes. diffused in different, we are displaced uh, virtually in a way, but I wanted to, to know concretely, does it affect your language, your Hebrew? You have been a long time in France, as, you have, as you've yes. mentioned, so uh, do you see bits and pieces of French or uh, of of German in your Hebrew? Uh, so these past years, since I have this passion for the German language, I, I, I had to a bit let go my uh, French identity, which is already complicated because it's a, an Egyptian French identity. My, my uh, grandmother, uh, Judith, born in Cairo, she spoke like uh, Dalida. Pourquoi pas que je prenne mon grand soutien d'ailleurs. And when I came to uh, the Sorbonne uh, at 20 something, they corrected, they sent me to a laboratory to correct my accent. All the other people, like all the, the people who spoke French, but, but not a French and a Parisian French. Every day after school, we had to sit with the headphones and repeat the sentences that the teacher was saying, and then she corrected. And back then, I, I, I thanked her, because thanks to that, I could speak like a, a Parisian. But now I think that that would, was really violent mm -hmm. uh, to us and to our identity, and that like everybody live here living in Berlin knows that that would have been impossible to, to think about doing uh, some things like, thing like that. And the mm -hmm. last thing I want to say is that I cannot not uh, mention my homeland in, in, in the political sense because this is another very uh, mm -hmm. difficult day um, in Israel. And every, everyone who is related to Israel knows that we say every time that this is a difficult day. But Obviously, <laughs> yes, and, and it's, it's always true, and, uh, and this is also um, really hard, mm. I mean, uh, being far away, and uh, it, you, have, you know that you're privileged, you know you have guilt, at the same time, uh, at the same time you, um, you are upset and angry, and mm. I'm... Yes, I think that uh, on this stage... Uh, in different degrees and levels, the, the, this feeling might be shared of an anger towards what is happening uh, back home and, you know, the conditions of possibilities of writing. How can you write when the conditions are not given and what do you do when you're far away? And Fariba, you, you haven't been uh, in Berlin for a long time and you were in, in, in Iran for most of, of your career until now. Uh, so I don't know if being abroad has changed your, your language, the language you write in, um, but uh, how this, has this new con diasporic condition uh, influenced your writing in these last uh, years? Well, I will first say that my mother is Turkish, but I have always written in Farsi. In fact, in fact, حرکت از یک زبان به یک زبان دیگر قبلا تجربه کردم راستش در مورد همه چیزی که دوستان گفتن تقریبا یک جورایی تجربه منم هست تا حدی ولی یک چیز دیگه که میخواستم بگم اینه که خب من خیلی یکی از منابع تغذیه نوشتنم تجربیات همه و اینجا خب یک مدل دیگه تجربه می کنم از یک درسته که اگر, اگر که نمیتونم چشمامو عوض کنم ولی میتونم زاویه دیدم در حقیقت عوض شده و تجربیاتم دیگه مثل سابق نیست و 
به جایی که بر میگردم نگاه میکنم دیگه مثل قبل نمیتونم نگاه کنم فقط تنها چیزی رو که میخوام به این حرفام اضافه کنم اینه که چیزی، یک چیزی رو هم از دست دادم من اینجا اونم اینه که یک جور تجربه بدنی در حقیقت یک جور این حتما شما میدونین که در ایران این چیزایی در مورد جنبش زن زندگی آزادی شنیدین و من اینجا بودم وقتی که این اتفاق افتاد هر روز هر لحظه همه خبرها رو دنبال میکردم همش اونجا بودم ولی مثل همه چیز مثل خبر بود نمیتونستم اینو با بدنم لمس کنم در حقیقت انگار نداشتم اونو در حقیقت احساس میکردم که در اون موقعیت پیش مردمم نیستم و این خیلی برای من خیلی خیلی برای من بخش بد این در حقیقت مهاجرت من بود in Iran but I write in Persian and so I'm used to move in between languages I, I have made this experience um, and I can um, yeah I'm okay with uh, many things my colleagues said concerning the experience um, abroad um, and but I also have um, some different um, experience because maybe I cannot change my eyes now that I'm living here, but I can change the perspective from which I see. And, <clears throat> and the looking back um, is not, what I see is not as before. And <clears throat> I have to tell that I also lost something. I lost kind of physical experience because you know what is going on in Iran. This is the movement of woman life um, freedom. And I was here when all this happened. And of course I followed the news, but there were news. I physically couldn't be a part or touch the whole thing. And this is a little bit sad. I missed this a lot. And <clears throat> yeah, that I could not be part of the people. Miriam, can you relate to what Fariba just said, uh, to this experience of missing something, of being there? You know, you are a, a theater director, right? So, you, And your first experiences as an author and director of course, there is a performative dimension in law as well, and this is your research. Um, but there is, you know, your theater pieces were made to have an impact, right? And to, to be a statement, to occupy a space and a place. And now you're occupying it here. Um, so I wonder how, how this, exactly what Fariba just described so beautifully about not having the physical experience of, of being there, and substituting it with doing it here to a different audience? Or do you have you know, Tunisians come and, and discuss, maybe repeat or echo uh, what is not happening or what could happen in Tunisia here with, what, with the work that you do? Uh, thank you for the question, but again, it's uh, three questions in one, so maybe I will speak about three things. First thing is about this uh, missing something. Of course, we miss... Uh, places, we miss per people, we miss language, we miss uh, um, uh, colors, we miss smells, we miss uh, traditions. This is, even if I uh, go back to Tunis, I, in these five years, I went back to Tunis for three months and then I missed Berlin, then I came back. So the missing, this uh, first missing, I mean, this emotional miss missing is there. But uh, for, as, a, as an intellectual or, the, or as a writer or as an artist, um, I don't, uh, um, I, I don't uh, feel that I have a homeland in a language or in a, in a, in a place. I am, uh, uh, 
I, I'm, I was, uh, isn't geworfen in das Leben. We are, we, we come to the, to, uh, to the life, we didn't choose where we are born. I'm born in Tunisia, I'm happy to be Tunisian, I'm proud to be Tunisian to the Tunisian, they are he uh, hearing me now and, uh, 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 yeah, looking, watching us uh, in streaming, of course, uh, this is very beautiful, and I love my, the Tunisian language. I, I miss to, to work in Tunisian language, but I don't have this, um, uh, I don't have this uh, original land or, high, or uh, homeland that I'm uh, looking, longing to go there, because I can do it. I'm not doing it. I'm staying here. But I am more in... Uh, I will maybe refer to, to, to two writers uh, who uh, wrote about the experience. Um, first, Edouard Said and uh, his memoir, Out of Place, and how he describes uh, this uh, feeling to be um, everywhere, to, fe to feel everywhere uh, with the wrong attitude, to feel everywhere out of space. As of for me here or in Tunisia or in France, as um, I mean, it, w it would be easier for me in French because uh, in France, because in French, I, in, in France, I can uh, practice as a lawyer. But I didn't want to stay in France because of the uh, 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 colonial history very close to me, and I cannot bear it. So here I am more stranger. The problem that, in, uh, as also Moshi said, I think here we feel more, here I have to play or to perform the Arab par excellence. And in Tunisia, I am not uh, 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 genug Tunisian or Arabic, yeah? So there is this problem of being all the time out of space, not fitting to the expectations that the others uh, are uh, uh, doing or are expecting from you. So we are reduced uh, to otherness machines. I, I feel like this. So for me, I, this problem to not uh, relate to uh, an original or a lost, uh, a lost uh, um, heimat, a lost uh, 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 patrie, uh, homeland, uh, comes as well from an, an, another idea that I think to, it's a condition for writers or for thinkers to be uh, this, this uh, errantry, this, to be on the road. Uh, uh, another writer uh, or philosopher that I really like, and he wrote, uh, there is a book now uh, um, published with uh, different essays from him called uh, L'Exil, c'est la patrie uh, uh, de la pensée. Uh, exile is the uh, homeland of thought. Uh, Kostas Axelos is a, a Greek philosopher who uh, had to flee from uh, uh, Greece and to uh, uh, to live in, uh, in Paris, and I think I identify in this. And as a writer, I go and read writers from the uh, 15th century, from, um, from uh, the 5th century. I, I think literature and uh, 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 philosophy, they are made to, pour traverser le temps, to go through time and spaces. Mm -hmm. So um, I don't, uh, and I think this, this, this feeling to be without a homeland, to be in the, in the, in the look, uh, uh, in this, in this, on the path to look for something else, something missing, everywhere missing, stranger everywhere, is something that uh, more, um, more speaks to me. The third last thing, I do it very schnell, I'm sorry, is legitimacy. Who I am, when I live here in, in, in Berlin now, this idea to be in contact, I'm in contact with the German, uh, uh, with the German or with the, this, uh, this different nationalities and uh, cultures, they, are, uh, they live in Berlin, and my direct uh, contact is with the people who are forming this society. So I try, my, my work is addressed to this society. I don't work out of a context. I produce out of work, there are questions, they will be with me everywhere where I will be uh, 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 going or setting. But uh, I work in a context, and that's why I'm not, I am in a dialogue with what is going on around me. But as a Tunisian, I don't feel the legitimacy to represent Tunisian culture here, because I don't live anymore there. But zum uh, Beispiel now, when there is something political happening in Tunisia, my, uh, my uh, journalist and media will, will contact my editor, and I will get uh, uh, Anfrage, as I will get a, a proposal to speak in the radio, about, to give a statement about political situation in Tunisia. And I find this very uh, embarrassing, because I, I think, 
am I here as an informant, informer? Am I here the political informant? No, I don't want to, 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 to play that because I don't have the legitimacy to represent a culture or a people because I don't feel that culture or people are a, a, a closed mm. uh, entity. Mm. And this is, makes me come back to this feeling stranger when, or fornia when I go back to Tunisia. Mm. Of course, even Odysseus, uh, when he came back to Ita Itaca uh, uh, after 20 years, his father, his son, his uh, wife didn't recognize him. Only his, his dog recognizes uh, Odysseus, and he, he uh, stabbed, uh, and he, he died, died yeah. uh, directly. So, and in the yeah. Italian tradition, he, he takes off again, right? In, the, the, in Dante's Commedia, he decides that he doesn't want to stay uh, in Ithaca, and he takes off again. So you know. um, I think you described very nicely you know, this, uh, this dialectics of also of the foreign game of this gaze that you're under because you're foreign authors, you're sitting on a, on a stage on literature and diaspora, right? Uh, so, uh, so in a necessary way, you will be asked about it and you will have to uh, account, uh, account for yourself. Um, uh, uh, Antonia, I liked a lot this, this idea of, of discomfort, of being uncomfortable. You know, this is, I think, something that we can, uh, that I've been hearing from, from all of you and that I know myself of being uncomfortable, but making a, of this discomfort actually a strength and, and, and not, uh, and not a, a weakness. Um, and I was wondering, um, because you, you were hinting at that before, uh, how is it that in your work, in your writing, you create this discomfort? Uh, how is uh, your literature uncomfortable, and I will, uh, in, in the closing, I will get into more closely into the text that I've been sent, but uh, as a general uh, reflection. Yes, uh, yeah. I don't know. I think it's a mostly unconscious process. I don't plan uncomfort in my literature, but it comes out uncomfortable, <laughs> inevitably. Uh, so I kind of explore this feeling of uh, uh, um, not comfortable characters in not comfortable places, which in Colombia is not hard. I mean, we are an uncomfortable place very much. Um, so I, I explore this, uh, for example, in the novel you've read, uh, this internal migration, which is a subject in Colombia. There are seven million people who migrated by force, were displaced by the war. Uh, so their life is uncomfortable necessarily. My city has 8 million people and maybe 6 million were kicked out from their original place uh, in the last 70, 80 years. So their, their position is uncomfortable. So we have this kind of in our identity inevitably. And uh, yeah, I, I, I try to understand the dynamics of power also through this un uncomfort. Uh, I don't know. I. I all my book, uh, it happens like Moshe said, when I'm out of Colombia, I write about Colombia. When I'm in Colombia, I write uh, about abroad. Uh, but when I wrote about Europe twice, it was also from a very uncomfortable place. I wrote uh, about an, a novel about an Islamophobic terrorist, a white French uh, guy who has a strange idea about history and the Republic, and he kills Arabs, basically. Um, so it was very funny the reception in France, in the French version, because it wa there was no critic at all, and then suddenly a critic said, uh, ah, he's the Colombian Hulebeck. So that way it was, you know, we can't relate to this, okay, he's a critic of the French society, he's almost French, let's say, so he, we can accept him. So it's, uh, for me it's interesting, this, this uh, not fitting in completely, and it's inevitable. I, my wife is Palestinian Israeli, so I was, a Jew married to a Palestinian Israeli living in Tel Aviv, in Jaffa. You know, it, it, it was, conflict was there inevitably, and it filters into my writing inevitably. I try sometimes, we were speaking before the, the talk, I try to write more comfortably and about, you know, soft, let's say, things. And uh, the, I grew up in a very comfortable environment, you know, in the middle class of Colombia, in a big city, no war, no discomfort. I try to describe that, and I find it very boring. I think <laughs> I can't, you know, maybe because I traveled and I was uncomfortable most of my life. Yeah. Do you think that literature has this, you know, I think we heard it also from Meriam, but is, it, is, is literature's task to 
you know, this is a, a famous Kafka saying that it, uh, it should be the hammer that breaks the ice inside of you, uh, literature. Would, yeah, you, would you agree with that? Yeah, yeah, very much, yeah. And I think Latin American literature is lacking that. There was a reaction to Garcia Marquez and that generation, and the reaction was to be very pleasant with one's life and to, most of the writers are middle upper class, so they write about, uh, I don't know, it, 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 there are many Edgar Kerets in Colombia. <laughs> it's like writing about the humoristic everyday life of the middle class, which I find very respectful, but I, I find it very boring. You know, you have to be Keret, which has a great sense of humor, and you enjoy reading, but otherwise, I don't like this literature. And the whole uh, critic apparatus, it's uh, mm -hmm. very much uh, saying this is the new Latin American literature. So I'm out of fashion completely, but I enjoy it. It's again being out of place. So. <laughs> yes, I think that is a common thread. Uh, Moshe, would you, would you, does it resound for you, this discomfort or raising discomfort, discomforting topics and irritating your readers? So I have, I spoke about discomfort before and about suffering sometimes, but also uh, this is a great independence. This is the greatest independence, I think, immigrating, because it has influence on every aspect of your life, and you feel that you, you feel that you created your life. And in my case, this is my third immigration, so twice to France and once to Germany. So it's like I recreated um, my, my life again and again. But there's a nuance, um, because I identify with many things uh, that my colleagues here say. Uh, there's a nuance with Hebrew because Hebrew is spoken officially and published only in Israel. And this is, um, and Israel, we should uh, remember, it's a, it's a tiny place, even though we hear about it all the time. Um, and there are potentially much less readers than elsewhere. We have one, you know, our, um, we have one uh, 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 FATS, we have one Deutsche <laughs> Zeitung or Le Monde, we have Haaretz. When I go uh, and like any, um, many Israelis abroad, uh, I, I, I check and I go to, to see Haaretz and, well, I identify with many things there, but it's in Hebrew, it's in my mother tongue, but I don't uh, refer to many things that they uh, relate to, that they talk about. It, it's not related to my everyday life in Europe, in, in Germany. I listen also and I read German uh, newspapers and they talk about other things uh, totally. Also, as a Hebrew writer, uh, we, we uh, um, us uh, uh, writers living abroad in exile, not in exile, in diaspora, uh, we, um, we, pay the, we pay a price. Um, for example, I gave talks in public libraries every week. So also I, gain, I mm. gained a living, but also I was in permanent contact with my audience. And I, I am willing to pay this price. I took my decisions, but uh, I think it's a bit different with, with big languages such yeah. as uh, uh, French, such as Spanish, such mm. as, uh, um, yeah. Um, and also maybe uh, uh, Fariba can... can can identify w with me uh, in the sense of, uh, of, of Farsi. Yes, I mean the the question the questions you 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 are you are raising are, are very you know it's it's again you are actually contradicting what we have been saying about the digital revolution, right? You're saying, no, there is actually a, a value and an importance to being physically like we are here today um, in a place and sitting together and talking and seeing the people uh, in, in, their, uh, in their body and flesh in front of you and... and communities, I have yeah. a, a petit yeah. clan uh, français, <laughs> uh, uh, so uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm in, in contact with, uh, with people from around the world. This is a great privilege, so that's, that's the other side of the other side. Sure, sure, no, it's, uh, this is, uh, it wasn't paying one yes. for the other, right? Yes. <laughs> but it's, uh, you know, it's, it's still important. I, uh, we have just been, if you saw the flyer, I don't know if you had the chance uh, to see the flyer, but we have this, been discussing for two days now uh, the relation between religion and literature. And uh, um, there is this uh, thought or reflection about uh, prayer being that moment where you turn to a distant other, right? You don't know if 
anybody is there, if anybody is listening to you, uh, but you still turn to this, uh, to this other, to this absent other. Um, so whether it is digitally uh, it, it, accessible or not, I was wondering, and maybe Fariba, I can, I can start with you, um, if you know, the, relig the, the religious atmosphere uh, of, uh, of where you come from is present in your texts. If it, if it is something that is relevant for you, um, this, uh, this connection to, to a distant other that is the image of, uh, of, of maybe the reader or the listener uh, to whom you turn. Uh, mm. یه مقدار تجربه من از مذهب با شما حتما متفاوته برای اینکه من ما بیشتر از چهل و چند سال یک حکومت زیر یک حکومت مذهبی زندگی کردیم و اصلا این 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 مدل از زندگی این مدل از مذهب خیلی چیزها رو از زندگی ما گرفته در حقیقت و یک یک مدل زندگی رو برای ما تحمیل کرده که خیلی هم برای ما خوشایند نیست بنابراین اون رابطه ای که احیانا شما میتونین با مذهب احساس بکنین من به راحتی نمیتونم در حقیقت um. Me, I have maybe a kind of little different experience with religion, uh, maybe in comparison to the others, because um, almost more than 40 years in my country, there's a religious government. And um, this kind of religion took many things away from us. And um, we were forced to live a certain life and um, so this is a different experience maybe to religion and I don't relate so much in my writings to religion. And this is a different relation to religion. But was it as a reaction to that? So is it, you know, a conscious taking a position and, and uh, creating, yeah. as Miriam was saying, creating another space, right? You create in your writing another space that should be, that is the space that should be, uh, in a way. برای من حالا که بر میگردم به اگر به همه کارها مو نگاه میکنم نوع مقاومت من در مقابل این مسئله اگنور کردن اون بوده. در کتابهای من شما خیلی کم به انصار مذهبی پیدا میکنین. انگار که من نه در جامعه مذهبی زندگی میکنم و نه هیچ. یعنی شاید این موزه دفاعی من بوده که حداقل در ادبیات خودم اونو حذف کردم. Okay, when I look back uh, to my work, what I wrote, um, I think I always try to ignore the whole fact with religion, mm -hmm. and you seldomly uh, will find uh, that I relate to religion in my literature. Um, I think it is kind of self-defense and a reaction in this direction, yeah. Mm. Moshe, how is it for you? I will go. <laughs> um, religion? What is this? <laughs> <laughs> I had an event in, the, in, in Provence, in Manosk, uh, um, about my novel Yolanda, Yolanda, <laughs> that, um, that was published in France, and... Um, I spoke for two hours in the end, like in, in front of like 200 people. In the end, someone stands and he says, but I didn't find anything that has to do with Judaism or religion <laughs> in your book. How come? And I, I didn't know. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I still don't know. Um, <laughs> uh, but I would like to add uh, something to what I said before. Um, it, to, to give a more concrete uh, example, because those of you who don't know it, it may, might be interesting to know. Um, the Israeli uh, Man Booker Prize, the Sapir Prize, um, is now um, only given, only nominated, can be uh, writers living in Israel. Mm -hmm. 
So that's, uh, that's unbelievable because in 2000, I think 15, Wobi Namda won, won and, uh, the, the Sapir Prize and he, he lives in New York. And ever since they decided that, you know, so I, I was nominated twice, one, one short list, one in the long list while, while living in Israel. Now, when I publish a, a novel, I cannot be nominated for the most prestigious prize in my own language, which, is, which I find uh, and why, why are you saying that uh, upon the question relating to religion? No, not to religion. I added to, no, I had, I have, I'm sorry, I have nothing to say about it. <laughs> no, but it's interesting because, uh, you know, the, your, your family backgrounds are diasporic yes. family backgrounds, right? Or return, this is the interesting thing because mm -hmm. you, uh, as you said at the beginning, your family's had a good life where they came from yes. and uh, and certainly brought you know that life back and in in, in or into Israel right in in the yes. in the in the process of immigration um, so I'm sure that there are little signs of this life uh, that is connected also among other things to religion and that it may find its trace in your works or do you, as Fariba said, also push it I, out because I, it's so... I, I can relate to that from another point of view. Uh, um, sometimes uh, when people refer to my texts, they find many allusions to, uh, to the Hebrew, uh, like, like Tavim, mm -hmm. so to the Bible and the Mishnah and, and so on. And they are, uh, they are sure sometimes that I come from a religious family. It's true also that here in, uh, in, in Berlin I have many friends who are uh, uh, ex-ultra-orthodox uh, or are living in um, different places on this scale. Um, I have nothing personally in this sense, but I learned these... Uh, these, I make these allusions because I, I read a lot of translations, masterpiece translations into Hebrew, mm -hmm. doing, uh, done in the, in the 60s, 70s, mm -hmm. 80s. And back then, they used, also because they had to invent, it was a new, you know, relatively new modern language, but also because that, th this is um, the Hebrew treasures. These are mm -hmm. the Hebrew treasures, and they used them. And I'm referring, in my allusions, to this is like a homage. Mm -hmm. So this is, the Hebrew allows me, the Hebrew treasures allow me to, to be connected mm -hmm. to this um, legacy. So this is another form of errand, to pick up uh, Miriam's yes, uh, early, early word, an errand also uh, of, the, of the text and of you know, this mm -hmm. religious canon that somehow in other ways comes up and loses yes. the connection to the origin and, yes. and starts wandering around yes. and presenting itself so in other words. Sometimes my translators, they say, what is this word? And I say, it, it, I mean, they, they look and they say, ah, oh, it's from the Mishnah. So you know the Mishnah? And I say, no, but I read it in Neely Milsky's mm -hmm. uh, uh, translation to the uh, Budenbrocks or other. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a very nice, somehow uh, uh, delayed or mediated access to this that makes it maybe more, uh, more bearable uh, under the conditions that we live in. Uh, Antonio, I, I was wondering because I know that you have traveled a, a lot inside Colombia, so you, um, you, know, you have experience of, uh, uh, of the leading religion, the, the, the majority religion, but you also met with indigenous communities uh, of, of Colombia. So does this, is this something that you have reflected about? It is uh, that is something that you see in relation. Yeah, I don't know enough about uh, indigenous cultural, uh, religious traditions. Uh, I, I lived in the area of the Amazon jungle where there are three different cultures and they, the three of them were very much damaged by uh, um, North American uh, evangelists in the 1970s. So they became Christian. Um, which is a shame, but they kind of create a syncretism of this neo-Christianity, American crazy Christianity, and uh, their own traditions. So most of them managed to keep 
Uh, all the knowledge of the plants and the animals, which is very important part of the uh, spiritual tradition, and mix it with the idea of this of sin. Paradoxically, for example, in some of the communities that I worked with, um, the fact that the Christians didn't allow them to drink alcohol, or that they, in the 70s they told them alcohol is a sin, saved them because part of the it's like in the American movies of the Far West. Part of the conquest strategies of the paramilitary groups, mafia, is to give alcohol to Indians. They, they don't have, I don't know the genetic explanation, but they become alcoholics immediately. So you could see in the white village that I was living in, in Puerto Nerida, uh, indigenous guys in the street, like drunk, 24 hours. So the ones that were Christian, paradoxically, were saved by Christianity from that. <laughs> um, but in general, they are polytheistic and they believe in nature, but I don't know much more than that. And religion in my work is not present at all. Uh, I don't think, not even indirectly. Um, but of course, spirituality for me is very important. Without a spiritual dimension or this other that you were speaking about, I wouldn't be able to live, to survive. So I guess it per permeates in my writing, but I don't speak about the institution of religion, mm -hmm. any religion. No, I think it's a very important differentiation that we have been actually speaking about uh, these days. Uh, so how, how is it important, or how, what do you understand with spirituality? What does it mean to you? I don't know. I believe there is something there, <laughs> bigger than us, or that gives some kind of structural logic to our actions. Uh, and I think there is something after death. That's as far as my <laughs> knowledge arises. But for me, it's enough. I, I feel very calm with, like when a relative dies, I feel much more calm than my sisters that are atheists. I feel it's a passage through life and we will meet somehow, somewhere. Um, but of course, because of the way I see things and because of the history of Colombia, I distrust completely religion. Like mm -hmm. I don't like the Catholic structure at all of power. And in the case of Colombia, it was horrible the way they contributed to the most reactionary right-wing system of education and, and you know, made the, war, the civil war 100 years longer just by insisting in this, you know, medieval understanding of religion. Mm. Yes, I think we ha are hearing um, analogous echoes again of, of, uh, of an intervention of, of a certain or a manipulation of religion or spirituality by statal institutions, right? And so uh, in your writing, you somehow counter that by, 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 oppose, by, by you know, excluding it, right? Yeah. Exclusion is a very powerful way of, uh, uh, of, of resistance and oppositions, and it sounds very strong in all, in all of your works. Miriam, how is it for you? Is it uh, a relevant part of your work? Uh, you know, theater can be a communal experience uh, as, as we see them often in, in, in religious settings, right? So, uh, um, one question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> one question, yeah. That, uh, <laughs> oh, la la. Um, genau. Uh, is it relevant for, for in my work? Uh, I think yes. I, uh, uh, at least I wrote a play against uh, political Islam in 2012 uh, because uh, after the uh, Yasmin revolution, after the, the uh, movement, that uh, the revolution that took place in Tunisia in 2010-11, uh, we had the first, we thought that we are fighting for freedom and for equality and for justice, and then we had the first government was a Muslim government, and uh, of course I... Uh, I am against political Islam, and I brought a play, and I, w I am active as well as a as a uh, as a lawyer and um, as a as a writer. I don't know, but yes, as a writer, as a play director against political Islam. But let's uh, think about religion another way. I don't practice any religion. I am born to a Muslim uh, family in a, a mu Arabic Muslim culture, and they uh, carry on with me uh, different values uh, from the culture, from the Muslim culture, from the Arab culture, and I find it a very beautiful culture. And um, there are a lot of uh, things uh, that could uh, inspire spirituality, inspire justice, equality. But uh, of course, when uh, religion became uh, become uh, a political uh, 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 tool, then it's very um, dangerous. 
and um, as a person, I don't practice any religion. And I believe as uh, uh, Anthony. Antonio in a kind of spirituality, as uh, I think the most of the post-contemporary uh, uh, sujet of the word, as, as most of us in this contemporary world, uh, genau. Um, but what is interesting, I find that uh, religion and literature, they are always as well, religion like, uh, like this topic that we are exp exploring now, it's always based on this uh, idea of exile. Yeah? You have with the Torah, exodus. You have with uh, Islam, al-Hijra, that means as well, exodus. You have with uh, a spiritual, different spiritual schools, uh, for example, in Tunisia, there is a tariqa. A tariqa, that means the way. You take the way to go. Uh, you, you have always to search for the way, to be on the road, to be out of place. And I think this is something which is interesting in this uh, uh, in this approach to, to, to religion. So this kind of restlessness, this kind of uh, um, being, um, living something to reach something else. I think this, this idea interests me more, or this idea, uh, I, explore, I explore this idea, or this way of uh, uh, looking at a religion, or religions, not one religion, religions, the whole, the, the many, the various religions of the world. And maybe I would like to, 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 fi to finish with a story, uh, because we are uh, writers and we tell stories as well, and I think something from this spirituality that I like very much, maybe you heard about, uh, about him, uh, is a wise fool in the a transcultural character who, um, who is from the Arab culture, Turkish culture, but I think it's really like a, a traveling character, Mullah Nasruddin. And Mullah Nasruddin, so he's a wise fool, and uh, uh, some, one day he was, or one night he was uh, in the street looking for something um, just next to a, a lamp, a lamp post in, in the street, and a neighbor passes by and asked him, what are you doing? And he said, I'm looking for a key, yeah. the, my house key. Yeah, you know the story, Fariba, of course. And uh, he said, okay, then I will look with you. Let's, let's search for it together. And they spent time looking for five minutes or six minutes, and then he said, but we don't find this key. Are you sure that you lost the key here? And they said, no, I know that I lost the key in my house. Then uh, the neighbor asked, but why are you looking for the key than here? <laughs> and then the uh, Mullah Nasruddin answered, yeah, because here there is more light. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe this is as well for us, this, uh, mm. it's, a, it's a story said in different as well spiritual um, schools to make us think where, where we are looking, what we are looking for, in, in, from which side. And maybe we go out of our side, of our homes, where we think that we lost our keys because we are looking for something else. And I don't know if we will find it or not, but this is a strategy. Maybe we, like, we let the, open, the question open. And maybe there is no key. <laughs> and maybe there is no key, of course. Um, thank you. Please join me in thanking our uh, guests this evening, Fariba Wafi, uh, Miriam Buselmi, Moshe Sakal, and Antonio Unger. Thank you very much for crossing thank borders. You, Chiara. Okay. Thank you very much, Chiara. And we now go over uh, to the poetic and musical part uh, of the evening with Dori Manor, uh, Eva Glasmacher, and Denisa Popova. Thank you very much.
איך יכול אדם לשיר שיר ארס לעצמו? איך יכול אדם להאמין שהוא לבד? אדם נפרם מילדותו כמו חוט מתוך מרבד, ואין דבר בטבע שיוכל להרדימו. אדם נוסע בנפשו לווילנה ומדריד צפונה מהזמן ומערבה מעצמו. אדם בונה גונדולות ומפליג מבריד לבריד. ואין דבר בטבע שיוכל להרדימו. בפוך לבן הוא מתכסה וחש כיצד הייתה אמו עכשיו קורעת וחופה את המיטה. הוא שר את שיר הארץ ושומע את עצמו. ואין דבר בטבע שיוכל להרדימו. ונדף דויטש. And the translation is by Thomas Spahr and uh, Amir Eschel. Entwirren. Wie kann man sich selbst ein Wiegenlied singen? Wie kann man glauben, allein zu sein? Wie ein Faden vom Teppich wird man von seiner Kindheit entwirrt. Und nichts in der Natur kann ihn einschläfern. Im Inneren fährt man nach Vilnius oder Madrid, nördlich der Zeit und gen Westen von sich. Er baut Gondeln und rudert vom Adern zu Adern. Nichts in der Natur kann ihn einschläfern. Mit Daunendecken umhüllt er sich und fühlt, wie seine Mutter jetzt bei ihm gekniet hätte, das Bett abschämend. Er singt das Fiegenlied und hört sich selbst und nichts in der Natur kann ihn einschläfern. Nošna voda So 
nothing's going so right. Never saw the days hurrying by when you're in love. My, how they fly. But blue do I see at last is truly, truly blue. your broken wings and learn to fly all your life. You were only waiting for this moment to arise. Sons are no Blackbird singing in the dead of night. Take your sunken eyes and learn to see all your life. You were only waiting for this moment to be free. Blackbird fly, blackbird fly into the light of the dark black night. Sansa no Sansa no of love dedicated to uh, the blue-eyed person that I love. At midnight, as the midnight calms, the lonely spaces in your palms, your eyes almighty, dazzling hue, at last is truly, truly blue. At midnight, as the midnight starts to speed the beat of nighty hearts, with neither wood nor brush, I to submerge myself inside this blue. Kachol kmo yarut bastav, kachol kmo dio, kachol kmo tav, kachol kmo vrid, uchmo nutzot, uchmo enecha bachatzot, kachol kmo gal amok bayam, kachol kmo sof, shel shetef dam, kachol mufshat, kachol kmo sfat ha'ahava. Blue like the woods of fall or spring, blue like blue notes, like writing ink, like pounding veins, like bluebirds fly, the color of your midnight eye. 
blue like a wave, like the last stage of a recovering hemorrhage, a blue unsung, the native tongue of love. At midnight, any midnight, I crawl on and merely crawling, try to find in lands I never knew the eye that's truly, truly blue. At midnight, as your midnight sparks fly on and flying leave their marks, a sly old tremble sprouts in you between my heart and spleen. It's blue, blue like the woods of fall or spring, blue like blue notes, like writing ink, like pounding veins, like blue birds fly, the color of your midnight eye. כחול כמו גל עמוק בים, כחול כמו סוף של שטף דם, כחול מופשט, כחול כמו שפת האהבה. Blue like a wave, like the last stage of a recovering hemorrhage, a blue unsung, the native tongue of love. Translated by uh, Ronen Sonis. The next poem that I'll uh, read um, is about um, a great Yiddish poet, Avram Sutzkever, born in uh, Lithuania in 1913, died uh, in uh, Tel Aviv, uh, 19, uh, sorry, 2010. Um, a great uh, modern poet, um, who lived in uh, Tel Aviv from 46 until his death in uh, 2010. Um, during the war, uh, he was in uh, the Vilnius ghetto and uh, a partisan uh, later on. Uh, he was the only uh, Jewish um, witness during uh, the Nuremberg trials in 46 uh, from the, the Russian side. And I, I had the great privilege of uh, knowing him and being, in a way, his uh, disciple. First in uh, Hebrew, but um, uh, there is a quote in um, Yiddish, which you might understand because of German. Um doik bistu, ich derweil um dorten. Translated, translated uh, into English uh, as, you are not of this world, um doik bistu. Ich derweil um dorten, uh, I, uh, for the time being, am not of the next world. Gishashnia in Sutzkever, a second talk with Sutzkever. And indeed, it's about uh, my second meeting with him when I was 18, and he was like very old. גישה שנייה עם סוצקבר, בקצף של הדיית, ספרייט יונת הנפש, משכשכת את ליבה. היכן נולדת, סוצקבר? אני במו ידיי את מקום הולדתי קריתי, העולם הבא. גישה שנייה עם נפש עטופה נייר זכוכית. היכן נולדת, סוצקבר? השקט הוולקני, יונת בזלת מלבינה בעין הדולחית. תשעים שנה היא מלבינה, אך מבטה לא קני. פגישה שנייה, מוטב אולי לומר פגישה נוספת, כי רק אתמול ראינו באגם שבטרקאי דגים מעופפים וצוענים שחורים כזפת, בבדולח ניחשו את החשוך בחשקאי, ורק אתמול ניטרנו מן היער פרטיזנים שכוח הכבידה אינו מספיק להפילם, מאז אנו דואים על המרחב המאוזן עם בריות מחונפות שלא ינוחו לעולם. בערב תל אביבי, בן תשעים ובן זכרחורת. יושבים על דיאט ספרייט ומשתכרים מן השיחה. היכן נולדת, סוצקבר? בשיר הבא. זכור את אשר עשה לך הזמן וכתוב. עכשיו, תורך. The second talk with סוצקבר. The second talk with סוצקבר. 
there in the foamy diet, sprite, the soul is bathing, practicing a dove-like dive. What is your place of birth? My place of birth? I had to pry it out of the earth with my own hands. It's called the afterlife. I'm having now my second talk with this sandpapered soul. What is your place of birth? Where the volcanic hash is thriving. His eye holds a white granite dove inside its crystal bowl. For 90 years it whitens there. Its glance is after lively. Our second talk, our emptieth. All this talking makes us tipsy. Just yesterday we heard it in Trakai, around the lake, the flying fish that flocked there, and a group of pitch black gypsies divined within their bowl the darkest wishes that I, may, that I make. Just yesterday we leaped out from the forest in a phalanx of partisans that gravity would never topple down, and ever since we're gliding over plains in perfect balance, with ever-moving creatures that fly by without a sound. We meet in Tel Aviv at dusk. He's 90. I'm a tremble. To trade old days for younger days and sip our diet sprite. What is your place of birth? In my next poem, so remember what time did unto thee and write. It's now your turn to write. What Oh, oh, oh. 
al alma mía que jamás se extinguerá, se extinguerá, se extinguerá. Piace tanto al alma mía que jamás se extinguerá, se extinguerá, que jamás Jamai, jamai, se extinguerá, se extinguerá. Poetry, poetry is a soul called to prayer. Defining poetry. I will tell you what poetry is. It's the very thing that got stolen from me before I could write it. It's the very thing I'm not able to feel or taste or see, though I do smell it better than some people. Poetry is a soul called to prayer. Out of the throats told steeple where the words moisin overshadows the darkness before it settles. Poetry is undefinable, language with petals. So I will tell you what poetry is. It's the very thing that's got stolen from me before I could write it. It's the very thing I am not.
About 20 years ago, um, in uh, the city of Arles, in southern Fran uh, France, I uh, was invited to um, a residency at the uh, uh, ancient uh, Van Gogh uh, Psychiatric uh, Hospital. And uh, in this um, beautiful building, in this uh, residency, I met a woman, an Israeli woman, that I uh, had not known before. Uh, and the first thing that I saw when uh, I met her was a necklace with um, a name of, uh, of a girl, actually, uh, on it. The name was Smadar. And she had presented herself as Nuri. So I asked myself, uh, what uh, is the story? And uh, it turned out that Smadar uh, was her daughter. Uh, that uh, had been killed uh, a, in a terror attack in Jerusalem in 1997. She was 14, Smadal. And Nurit, who is a very courageous woman and very political, uh, together with her uh, husband uh, uh, and other people, uh, founded uh, the organization of parents uh, Israeli and Palestinians uh, who um, lost their children uh, in wars or in uh, terror attacks uh, from both sides. Um, and an organization which is highly controversial, controversial in the um, um, contemporary Israeli context. Um, and this uh, brave woman, um, uh, Nurit Peled El Khanan, is um, her name, uh, became um, a great inspiration for me and also a friend. And uh, during this month in um, Aal um, at Van Gogh's, uh, I used to uh, look at her every day to look and to learn and to admire. And uh, this um, um, short poem is about her, about her daily life, actually. I will read it first in Hebrew. It's very short. And then uh, in English. It's called A Mother, M. It's dedicated to Nurit Peled El Khanan in memory of Smadar. Smadari yeshaot shehen shalam. לקום בשש בבוקר למשל, בלי טעם בלשון ובלי תפילה, שעות שהן רק שקט מחושל, לגשת למטבח ולהטריח, קיריים וביצה וכוס קפה, לדעת שאין דרך להבריח, לבדוק אם הפריחה עלתה יפה. כי רק אתמול נבלה הקריזנטמה 
ואי אפשר לסבול שהיא נבלה. לזרוע בלי שמחה, לקצור בלי דמע. סמדרי ישרות שהן שלה. A mother. סמדרי, there are hours that are hers. Like getting up at six o'clock, for instance. No taste under the tongue, nor any prayers. These hours are mere silence, forced and distant. To come into the kitchen and to butter a stove, an egg, a cup of coffee, too. To know that there is no cure, that there is no other way but to check how green the garden grew. Because the other day the mums have died, and this is more than anyone can bear. To sow without a joy, to reap dry-eyed, smadari, all these times belong to her. sich selbst ein Wiegenlied singen? Wie kann man glauben, allein zu sein?